it will be my, my privilege now to, to address the issue of aging with hemophilia uh, from the perspective of the, the orthopedic or musculoskeletal care. I have no, nothing to disclose in reference to this presentation. And I would like to, to summarize the orthopedic perspective, uh, which I think has been very well documented in, in the literature. And uh, I would like to uh, propose we address this paper by Siboni et al. from the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. And what you see in the graph is in, uh, in, in empty blocks here in white, it's the, the prevalence of, of comorbidities in men aged 65 to 78 with and without hemophilia. So the empty blocks, the white blocks, will be without. And you can see when, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, there is a protective effect, apparently, in, in persons with hemophilia. The same is true for hypercholesterolemia. You can see there's a higher prevalence in, in men without hemophilia than in men with hemophilia. Now, strictly from the, from the musculoskeletal perspective, which is this bar that has been highlighted, you can see that the, the probability of having musculoskeletal disease is more than double in, in men with hemophilia in this age cohort than in men without hemophilia. Uh, I think this is something that does not come to a surprise for an auditorium like this, since all of us uh, have been working one way or the other to prevent musculoskeletal complications from appearing at all, and also from appearing at an early age, trying to delay that appearance that in some situations is unavoidable. So here we can see clearly that there is a, at least a double of risk of musculoskeletal problems. And this paper by, by Dolan uh, in the Journal of Hemophilia, uh, he addressed the challenge of an aging hemophilic population. And he stated that there was joint deformity, muscle weakness, pain, and difficulty with uh, mobility in general. And therefore, there was an incre increased risk of falls. Now, the increased risk of falls is a problem in all healthcare, not only in persons with hemophilia. It is a huge challenge. If you look at any accreditation agency around the world, it would be among the first five or six uh, elements of concern in any set of standards. Certainly, that is the case for Joint Commission here in, in the U.S. Now, on the underlying situation that is different in, in persons with hemophilia is the impaired proprioception. And I think this is the key message that I would like to, to transmit at this point. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the word proprioception, it has to do with the awareness of the position of one's body. And this appears trivial, but it is at the essence of, of all musculoskeletal surgery, especially that that has to do with ligaments. Um, now, the good news is that proprioception can be retrained, and it also can be enhanced at any age, in any circumstance. And uh, the professionals from the physiotherapy and rehabilitation and sports medicine spend most of their time achieving this goal. And interestingly, sometimes the difference between a high-performing athlete who goes back to being a high-performance athlete and one that doesn't. It is not the surgery or the, the actual technical result, but the ability of that person to regain the proprioceptive skills that will allow them to perform at a certain speed in a certain combination of movements. So this is behind the act of falling, and it should be the center of our concern. And the last of the good news is that training for proprioception can be fun. You don't have to go to a hospital. You can go to a gym. You can do Pilates. You can do many other fun stuff. Maybe not Zumba like is going on in the convention center, even though the general appearance of the trainers is, I would say, very attractive in both genders. But uh, that's an option, too. But it can be retrained, and this is very important. And this is what people who work in the musculoskeletal area look at when you talk about falls, they're thinking proprioception and equilibrium. 
there's been a lot of discussion in this meeting about osteoporosis. And I think this, this is a, a great progress because, of course, behind osteoporosis, there is an increased fracture risk, and this is something that concerns us all. From the point of view of, of uh, persons with hemophilia, there is literature to prove that hepatitis C virus and the infection with HIV also contribute to this lack of, of preservation or accumulation of bone density, therefore making these persons more susceptible to fractures if they fall. Now, I must tell you that from my practical experience in, in the clinic, this doesn't happen to be a problem. I don't seem to see patients fracturing as I do see people who come in with hip fractures who are elderly non-hemophiliacs. But I am sure that there is a problem and I think we need to address it. Now, from the clinical perspective, I would like to share with you our experience in patients who are non-hemophiliacs uh, and the risk of over-treatment. And, and I, I, this meeting has reminded me of what happened many years ago when this became an issue in, in, in the world uh, in terms of women's health. And there was this enthusiasm for treatment of osteoporosis. Diagnosing and treating osteoporosis is very difficult. It requires experts in bone metabolism. It, they can be endocrinologists or rheumatologists or orthopedic surgeons, but they have to be an expert in this area. This is not something to be taken lightly because it is easy to accumulate an extra amount of mineral content in the bone. And the bone becomes brittle. And if it does become brittle, even though, even though it, it appears strong, it is extremely fragile, like any, any stiff material, like glass. Very strong, but brittle. This is a paper published by us in 2011, but there are many like this in the literature. If you look outside the, uh, hem the literature of hemophilia of a 65-year-old woman who complained of hip pain, and you can see there's this little ripple here in the subtrochanteric area in the lateral cortex of the right femur, and the same is true in the left femur. And in this uh, scintigraphy over here, you can see an increase in the uptake of isotope on both subtrochanteric areas, which you can interpret as remodeling, inflammation, or maybe a stress fracture that is starting to occur because of the multiple cyclic, cyclic loading of the femur, which lead to fracture. And you can see this woman fractured spontaneously. This is the fracture of the proximal femur. And she was, of course, fixed. And then we had surgery on the other side to prevent fracture as well. This is a result of the enthusiasm for over-treatment and inappropriate treatment of osteoporosis. So my message is, I think it was about time we paid attention to this subject, but it is a subject that has to be taken into consideration with great care because it is easy to overtreat. Uh, and then you would see fractures from rigidity, not from lack of mineral density. Now, back to the paper by Siboni et al., which essentially summarized all of the issues that had to do uh, with articular problems in patients with hemophilia as well. So they stated that when you compared to patients without hemophilia, once again, the white boxes, you can see that there is more joint instability, that there, is, there are flexion contractures in the joints of patients with hemophilia, whether that's not the case, that's not the case in the general population. There is impairment of range of motion. There is crepitus in both patients with and without hemophilia, and this is not very relevant, but, but you feel it as a patient and you're concerned, but it doesn't make much difference. There's axial deformity, it means angulations, muscular atrophy, joint swelling, and finally chronic, chronic synovitis. I'll give you some examples. But this, again, is no surprise to you. You've been coming to meetings with hemophilia, you've been seeing the patient, the, the, your family members, or you've been, you've been studying the subject, and these problems have been around forever. I think the difference we are experiencing now is that we're starting to see these problems later. We used to see these problems in patients who were 20 years old. Now they come later because they have much better treatment in their early stages. 
So there are not many surprises in the musculoskeletal area in terms of aging. We're just seeing the same problems, but later, which I think is a very good thing. So this is an example of an elbow that is unstable because you can see that uh, olecranon has deepened itself in the trochlear groove of the humerus, therefore allowing slack in the collateral ligaments, and this will produce a swinging motion on the elbow when opposed to resistance, which is very inconvenient. This is a typical gesture on, uh, of a man with hemophilia who has a limited supination, and he would compensate bringing, bringing, bringing the elbow in to try to support a tray or shake the hand of a, of a friend of a, of, of a mate because of lack of rotation of the forearm. That's an example of impairment of range of motion. We, I think we have seen atrophy in all of its manifestations, uh, some due to inactivity, others due to severe bleeding within the muscles that scar down and won't allow that muscle to go back to its original volume. Uh, uh, this is not new. It, as I said before, it, it, is, it continues to happen. It just happens later. I think we see less axial deformity because it really takes a lot of destruction uh, to allow for axial destruction. And these, uh, or this, this type of uh, problems would require joint replacement or osteotomies, which again have been around forever. And finally, I think perhaps a, a, me a, a meeting like this is one of the places in, in the academic world where we address synovitis with greater frequency, and we, we, we know how to treat it. Uh, there are several ways of doing this, or, uh, at least five or six, and I think WFH has developed expertise and has communicated the expertise throughout the world about how to address synovitis. So you can see, even though I would have loved to surprise you with new problems, at least from the intellectual standpoint, it would be interesting. I think there are problems that we've been dealing with and they're easy to, easier to deal with if they appear later in life. I would like to summarize bringing up a few points. I think now more than ever, it is clear, it doesn't matter where you live, that investing in early prophylaxis will allow for the development of a musculoskeletal resource that would be of extraordinary value in future life. So there is no better place, there is no better return on investment than investing in early prophylaxis, exercise, and maintaining function at very, very, very early stages. Months of age, one year, two years, very early on. There is no question from the musculoskeletal perspective that is the way to go. We also have literature to prove something that was hard to prove before, and Randy, I think, can tell us about this. And there was a, a, formerly the belief that when a man with hemophilia was about 18 years old, skeletal was mature, and you could take this person off prophylaxis, and that was it. We know that that is not the case. There are, there are some very uh, well-designed studies in the literature over the last 10 years that prove that you do require prophylaxis throughout life, time, and if you do that, you will have better performance, less bleeding, greater joint survival, along with a much better quality of life. So, so the, the conversation does not stop at year, uh, 18 years of age. The third point is that there are no surprises in the musculoskeletal lesions. They are less severe as the prophylaxis increases and they appear later and they're easier to treat if they appear later. As Anne pointed out, men eventually do mature like good wine take that home with me, and uh, then it's a, it's a whole different ballgame than trying to deal with an adolescent. The, the next point is that proprioceptive training will prevent accidental lesions, not only fractures, but sprains and uh, uh, trauma uh, all over the economy, and we should develop a culture of exercising in a fun way. You don't have to go necessarily to an environment that simulates a hospital. I think the most productive environments are those that are fun, but are completely populated by professionals. So we, in my environment, in Colombia, we see more and more physios and rehabilitation specialists working in external facilities to the hospital, in environments which are much more relaxed, 
but with the structure of their professional approach. And I think that is fun. It is more fun than going to the hospital to get, to get care. And finally, I, I have a strong bias because most of the work that I do has to do with the hip. And we see a lot of hip fractures due to bone uh, rigidity because of the overtreatment of osteoporosis. So I think this is an issue that we have to address, but we have to address, the, address it in a very balanced and objective manner.